Hi, I'm John Atak, and I'm extraordinarily pleased to have Hoyt Richards as my guest today. We we met, oh, when was it? It was last, last year before last now. Yeah, exactly. July. Absolutely, um, at the conference in yeah. Uh, Manchester. Yeah. Well, yeah. actually, you weren't at the conference. I came to, to your place after the conference. Yeah. I was at the conference, yeah. I, I was at the conference too, but I avoided you all the time. Ah, smart. I, I even, I even actually managed to speak at the last ICSA conference. Imagine it. And I wasn't oh, well sort of done. pushed into well five done. minutes at the, the side. But um, anyway, I, first of all, if you could introduce yourself to, to the viewers and, and, and tell us um, something of your backstory, your, your background before you joined uh, an authoritarian sure. group. Uh, that's right. That's right. So uh, my name is Hoyt Richards. Um, Born in Syracuse, New York, grew up outside of Philadelphia, and um, presently I live in Los Angeles. I am a uh, an actor, a writer, and a filmmaker. Um, for many, many years, I was also a fashion model, and all those years while I was a fashion model was when I was involved with um, the, this group called the Eternal Values, and uh, Eternal Values, uh, I came to finally uh, understand was a cult and was kind of a, I guess if you categorize it, it was a a religious, high control, um, doomsday, uh, new age cult. Uh, so we tick a few boxes, and yeah. um, uh, and it was quite a journey for me to um, not only get involved but also you know, extricate myself out of there. I met my so-called uh, guru when I was 16 on the beaches of Nantucket, um, which is an island off the coast of uh, Cape Cod, which is near Boston in uh, America. And, um, you know, it's a very kind of uh, waspy, kind of upscale um, uh, place that was not where you think you're going to be uh, meet a cult leader. Uh, but that's where my family would summer and they still summer there every summer. And, um, and that's actually where I met him, but he was based in Manhattan. So when I went to university at, uh, at Princeton, which is in New Jersey, uh, I was about an hour outside of Manhattan. And that's when I started to visit him on the off season. Uh, at that point I was 18, uh, or 19 actually. Um, and that's where kind of, uh, the deeper hooks went in and uh, and ultimately uh, I, I played American football while I was at university. Mm -hmm. And when I went to, suffered some shoulder injuries and it was really kind of having a life crisis of finding out that I probably couldn't play any further. And that was such a, an issue of a, of, of a self identity crisis mm -hmm. just for myself in a sense. Um, I, I felt very lost and confused and, and uh, unknowing of where to go from there. And that was kind of when the cult leader really presented an opportunity as, uh, to start, start spending more time in New York and look into acting and modeling. And so um, being of uh, someone at 20 years old and not knowing really what to do with their lives and thinking, mm -hmm. well, if I can't be a football star, maybe I'll just try to be a star. You know, that was probably the rationale. And I don't think I went any deeper than that. <laughs> Uh, but that was the hook that started me going into New York and spending more time with him and his group, his, his entourage of sorts. And, Can I um, um, pick up on one of the misconceptions that, that we frequently hear about members of cults, authoritarian groups, um, which is sure. that, that be, people like you and me are unintelligent. How, how well did you do at Princeton? Yeah, I, I did well. I mean, you know, I was... Yeah, going in there, I was, um, uh, you know, uh, one of, always one of the top of my class. Uh, in junior high school, I was top of my class, um, and I moved transferred to a public, I mean, from a public school to a private school uh, at my mother's um, request because she felt I wasn't being challenged at the public school, and so I wasn't top of my class there, but I did very well, and um, and I actually spent a year going to school in England uh, where I uh, I took my A levels. I uh, I had, uh, I took, uh, I was only there for a year, so I took two A-levels instead of three in mm. chemistry and biology. And at that point I was, had grand, uh, illusions of grandeur, thinking perhaps I might be a doctor. And uh, that was quickly uh, 
brought down to earth once I realized what was exactly involved. But yeah, I, I always, I always um, uh, consider myself um, competent at school. Um, but uh, as, I, as I say to many people, uh, quite often being bright or, or those considered to be bright, um, and me in particular, I think, and, and probably there's more, uh, there's a lot of insecurity around that from the point of view of, you know, why did you get dealt a winning hand from a certain mm -hmm. perspective? And, uh, and I seem to not only do well at school, but I had a lot of friends. And uh, so I had a good social life. And then I was a successful athlete. And I think all of those things sent a message to myself that life isn't that challenging to me. And I'm not really sure why things seem to come easier to me than others. Mm -hmm. And what am I supposed to do with that? And uh, so when uh, the cult leader approached me about his perspective of the world, which, um, which sounded intriguing. And, and as I say to people, if you don't really have a game plan, but you feel like you should, and, um, and you feel like there is potentially a greater purpose to you, your um, existence rather than me at that time of, chasing girls and drinking beer and scoring touchdowns, then, uh, um, then you're kind of receptive to someone saying, well, there is potentially a higher purpose to your life. Mm -hmm. And I think um, when faced with his game plan, which, which he was very enthusiastic about, which was sounded a lot better than my no plan, uh, um, that's really where the beginning, you know, the uh, receptivity occurs. As I've told many people over the years, um, my control works on everyone. You just have to be receptive. So if you're at a point in your life where you're receptive to hearing what someone else has to say and from your perception, they're providing answers to some of these questions you may be asking, which in my case, I'm like, what am I gonna do with my life? What is the purpose of my life? Is there a way for me to, to be a better person, maybe be less selfish, maybe contribute more to my fellow man than just seek my own personal hopes, dreams, and, and ambitions, um, that can sound really appealing. And that was kind of the pitch that he made. Um, not, not like hardcore on the beach at 16. It was more of um, something that kind of evolved over the years. I mean, the, I think one of the things that's interesting about my story, John, is that um, I got to experience from the time I got to know this guy, uh, Freddie Von Mears, um, I kind of, it was like a startup that I got in on the ground floor. So I watched it become a cult. Like it really wasn't an established group when I met him. It was more of a, um, a narcissist with um, uh, an entourage. Yeah, you know, that's right. Common right. Dynamic. You know, you have these narcissist personalities, you know, that um, are constantly seeking attention and constantly seeking control over others because of whatever wounds they've encountered in their lives. Mm -hmm. And, um, and usually there needs to be some sort of catalyst that uh, occurs that elevates their, their spectrum of influence to something much greater than what it is currently. So when I met him, it was really kind of this entourage phenomenon. And, and my first trips going to visit him in New York were really going to Studio 54 and whooping it up in the city that I you know, didn't know much about and, and really got swept off you know, my feet as far as thinking, my God, coming from a, the suburbs of a city and then coming into to Manhattan and experiencing Studio 54, you know, I thought I'd been given my baptismal fire to uh, what the real world was about. And that was very intoxicating. And I would have never suspected that that was part of the seduction process of what would become a cult. Mm -hmm. And um, but that's ultimately the way it played out. So, uh, I started spending more time in New York. I got to know the group. Um, the catalyst that occurred, which really elevated the group from this kind of entourage to becoming what we would more or less associate as being a more typical cult, was this um, metaphysical writer. I don't know if you're familiar with her, Ruth Montgomery. No. Are you familiar with her? Yeah, so, so Ruth Montgomery had written a number of books on various metaphysical topics and um, Frederick's uh, sidekick, this guy, John Andriotis, actually, you know, reached out to her and said, oh, I, I want to tell you about my teacher. He's this extraordinary guy. 
And so the way it played out was Ruth's upcoming book, uh, which came out at night in, I think it was 1985, which is the same year I graduated from university. Mm. Um, she incorporated four chapters from this book called Aliens Among Us um, about Frederick and, uh, and, and, and his friends. I'm even in the book. So um, it was this kind of um, street cred that he was given that mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden anointed him as one of the next great teachers. And the book was all about walk-ins. And I don't know how familiar you are with the walk-in phenomena, John, but uh, uh, Fred had claimed to be a walk-in and the book was all about the walk-ins. And the reason it was saying aliens among us is because um, Freddie was very into um, astrology and, and, and made the claim that besides having multiple lifetimes, uh, that we actually spend lifetimes in other realms throughout the universe, mm -hmm. and uh, which isn't altogether ludicrous, but his his basic standing was the place that he called his home. Uh, conveniently happened to be this star Arcturus, which conveniently happened to be the spiritual center of the universe, and that was the place that was his home, and that he claimed that he was coming into this body uh, to take over this person's karma and, 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 and just kind of short, it's a shortcut. So you don't have to go through infancy and teenage years. You can, you can come into a soul who's, who's depressed and maybe suicidal and basically take over their karma, but enter their body as an adult and carry on not only their karma, but then do the work that you want to do. And his work was going to be, I'm going to find the other Octarians and we're going to do fulfill our mission, which we all agreed to do back in our tourists but they're, they will all have forgotten. I'm the only one that remembered and I'm here to kind of remind them what our mission was. And so he was out here searching for fellow Octarians and, and, um, and that was, uh, uh, you know, was something that when you got anointed, you felt pretty great about. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, as we learned with these things, no way of proving any of it, but we've learned that the power of belief and things that you can't prove is you know, quite often much stronger than something you can prove in a science lab or mm -hmm. something like that. So, so that, that book basically elevated him to the status of, uh, of someone who was a rising star. And we had, I think, upwards of 40 to 50,000 people on, on a mailing list that were writing to us. And so we had to create an office and then we started doing seminars and dispensing certain books and audio tapes and it, that's where it started to become more like uh, a textbook cult. And, um, and ultimately that, was, uh, that went on for around five years until um, Freddie uh, passed away uh, in February of 1990. Mm -hmm. um, and he died of AIDS uh, related um, uh, ammonia, I think it was, um, but um, after, after claiming to be asexual for years, we found out that he was actually um, living a, a, a second, you know, an altered uh, life behind the scenes and, and had uh, contracted uh, the HIV virus. And, and so he died. And un, not unlike um, like Scientology, you know, just because someone dies doesn't mean the group stops. So there was a bit of a power struggle, but ultimately this guy, David Seaman, who was, who was a chiropractor took over and, that, and then the group went on for another 10 years. And we kind of moved from Manhattan down to North Carolina, where we had um, four, four years of stored food and bunkers and guns, and we're waiting for the apocalypse. And uh, uh, which has been one of the predictions that Freddie had made, you know, from the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, this horrible end times was coming, which is a common thread in a lot of these groups. And ultimately for me, um, as the millennium was approaching, because that was kind of when it was supposed to happen. Um, I was working so much then as a fashion model and traveling so much. I was on the road probably over um, 300 plus days a year. Um, so I wasn't around the group as much on a day-to-day -day basis, although uh, I was still deeply, deeply influenced. And you know, one of the things we can talk about is I think once you know the rules, you become your own worst prison guard. So yes, it's, yeah. it's terrible living there 24 seven, but just because you're not there, it doesn't mean you don't self-flagellate and, and abuse yourself because you, 
you know what the rules are and you know that you're not abiding by, by them all the time and you're at, and for me I had to kind of check in with the group at the end of every day and in essence spin doctor what how I performed that day because I didn't want to get in trouble and likewise uh, you know anyone on the outside who I had relationships with which were frowned upon I had to lie about and certainly the relationships I had with those people outside the so-called circle um, I cannot really tell them what I was involved with mm. within the group so I I basically felt like I was on some level lying to everyone all the time, which yeah. was a really horrific existence. And uh, it's like a, it's just like a Pac-Man that kind of eats at your soul over time. And so ultimately, by um, as the millennium is approaching and, and his predictions were all about these storms coming and these natural cataclysms, because he was it was building up to, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the theories, uh, Edgar Casey, I think was one of the I first have, ones yeah. about a pole shift. So we believe this natural uh, calamity would occur, which would virtually wipe out 99% of the population. But uh, he had told us what one of the safe places was, which is where we had moved to in North Carolina. And so that's why we were prepared to survive the aftermath of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but at this point, I'm still flying around. I'm in London or Paris or Milan, and I'm looking around going, I don't think this is maybe gonna happen. And if it's, going to happen it's not going to happen on the timeline that he said mm -hmm. and um but at this point the group is so entrenched down in north carolina and lost in their own bubble that me um because i stupidly volunteered those thoughts at one point of which uh, uh i got crushed for <laughs> and and what happened then was uh kind of a re-indoctrination process because it was on some level my critical thinking was starting to kick in a little bit mm -hmm. again wait a second, something, you know, something smells a little fishy around this whole thing. Um, so that re-indoctrination process involved them shaving my head so I couldn't model anymore. I was quarantined down to our North Carolina compound where I had to be the first one up, the last one to bed, yeah. do every type of slave-like labor to teach me humility. And, um, and I was a bit pressed and resistant. And, uh, um, you know, I um, was considered to be resentful to mm -hmm. my situation when I should have been embracing it with a smile and gratitude for this wonderful spiritual opportunity I had to be with my What's friend. wrong with you? Yes. Sorry. And so, uh, so ultimately, it led to a lot of conflict. And, uh, and I would literally um, face a verbal firing squad every night, uh, we called it the hot seat in those days, but you would be sat before whoever, whichever members were around. And at that point, the group had, uh, our group was never massive. It was uh, at maybe at its peak a hundred. And, and at this point, through the journeys of the group, we were less, I'd say around 20. So whether there was 12 or 15 people around, I would um, have these people literally confront and you know, more often scream at me about how I had been uh, in a bad attitude that day and how I hadn't performed with this right attitude. And, um, and that could go on for two hours or sometimes 12 hours. I mean, I would literally go catatonic. Um, I was so terrified of saying anything because I thought whatever I might say could make it worse that I ended up just not being able to even speak. And it's one of the things I've learned in, in the recovery process that when you're in that fight or flight mode and you kick into that kind of midbrain part, you can't really access <clears throat> your higher cortex, which is your personality and your ability to reason. So the most simple questions are basically uh, almost impossible to even answer. And, and you process that in the moment as uh, that there's something seriously wrong with you and that maybe you're brain damaged and maybe uh, you're, you're in somehow um, brain deficient. And, mm -hmm. and, and I would actually beg them to tell me what to do. So this is where that process of thinking, oh, they didn't, they didn't influence me. I asked them to tell me what to do. And, uh, and that of course, you know, I've learned is not accurate, but ultimately um, it led to me uh, trying to escape. And I, it took me three attempts, but I finally got away. Mm. And, uh, and that was the summer of 99. And then I went into uh, like a pretty severe PTSD response of which it took me about, uh, I'd say a year and a half 
to um, start to consider maybe it wasn't just me that was the problem. Perhaps mm -hmm. the environment I was in might have something to do with how terrible I feel. Um, and that was, and that was uh, aided by um, me being able to luckily uh, reconnect with another former member who also, because that's what had happened. I, when I escaped, I left North Carolina and I moved to Los Angeles. Um, and uh, part of the fun part of the story, this is where I moved in with one of my oldest friends from the fashion business, this guy, Fabio, who's a very well-known supermodel. You know, he's like this Thor-like character who uh, is bigger than life and, and, um, and had a very successful career, but he had always had this open door policy of, um, you know, whenever I came to LA, I could stay with him. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and uh, it's one of the things I've learned since, um, you know, having conversations with them, because at the time I was completely freaked out and traumatized and didn't know what, what had happened and certainly hadn't even identified it as being a cult. And I was convinced that I was the problem. And it was great to have a friend who could just embraced me coming in with an open door policy and knew well enough through his own kind of sensitivity that something was seriously wrong, but probably the last thing I needed was to be asked about it and just <laughs> give me that time to incubate. Mm -hmm. And with the faith and understanding that when it was time and I was ready to talk, I would come to him and talk. Mm -hmm. But up until that point, just leave him alone and let him do his thing. And that was really a, a vital part yeah. of me figuring things out was not having someone question me because I didn't have those answers. And that was terrifying to even think about trying to answer those questions. But when I, um, when I reconnected with a guy who had left the group like four or five years before me, and, and I think it's always easier to see someone else's situation than your own. Mm. And I looked at him and I'm like, you know, he seems to be having a really hard time. <laughs> I think he's in trouble and uh, I think I may be too. So we ended up, he wasn't in a great living situation either. And, and I felt like I had kind of overlasted my visit with Fabio. So we ended up getting a, an apartment together and we, and for the first six months we just started to deconstruct our experience and eternal values and you know it's just kind of like going hey remember when remember when this thing happened it's kind of weird right what did you think was really going on and, and so we would just start to kind of talk things through and ultimately i think it was i'm not sure if it was me or him but at, at some point uh the, the 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 sentence came out like well do you think it was a cult and um you know, I was like, well, probably not, right? And of course not. And I mean, but but I really didn't know anything about cults. And and my my main criteria while I was in the group, and it was mainly fueled, obviously, out of my own arrogance, which was fueled by my own ignorance, was that the group couldn't be a cult because I was in it, and that was <laughs> enough criteria for me. Like. Well, someone like me doesn't join a cult. So the fact that I'm in the group means you can't be a cult. And that does seem to work for almost everybody. Yeah, <laughs> right. It really does. And, uh, and so, um, so it was through these conversations that I finally said, well, listen, I know it's probably not a cult, but let me at least do some cursory research because it was something. And at least I can check that off you know, the, the grid. And, um, and that's when I went on the internet and I found um, a bunch of books on uh, cult and the top selling book was Steve Hassett's book. <laughs> and, um, and I remember looking at it and had these great reviews and things, but um, in, the, in the, the bio it's saying that he had been in the Moody's and I, and, I, and I had seen the Moody's as an infant, you know, like growing up in the airports. And I thought, okay, those are, strange people. Mm -hmm. So I immediately had this judgment of, well, I mean, if someone got involved with that, there must be something really wrong with them. And, and, and that would never be something I'd get involved with. <laughs> and so I had this resistance at first of even wanting to get the book, but then the reviews were so strong. I said, well, listen, all right, let me just do some research. I'll get the book and kind of see uh, what it says. And the first 
I think it's the first chapter and a half or so, he's, he really kind of gets into his indoctrination process mm -hmm. and how it all unfolded. And that was where the light bulb went off because I was like, you could have just changed the names and it was my story. Yeah. And, um, and that's where uh, I came to the acceptance of not only had I been in a cult, but that my cult that I considered to be this incredibly special experience that would be so hard to describe to anyone was just textbook, point by point by point, as the book declared, and so that it wasn't even special. <laughs> um, so <laughs> all of this was a you know massive uh, psychological crash, mm. of which uh, was devastating. But like anything, it was it was what I needed, and it was kind of as I say to people all the time, if you if you can't get the proper diagnosis, how could you possibly get the proper medicine to even facilitate any form of healing? So uh, that was the first step. And, uh, and that's kind of when I went down the road to start, um, you know, obviously I, got, I, I went into massive self-education. I started to do some therapy and some counseling and, um, and ultimately Steve even, I, I reached out and connected to Steve through some other cult survivors and we became friends and and actually you know which one of the things i'm you know kind of for me very proud of in the sense of, of seeing my life come full circle when steve did um his 25th um anniversary edition of, of combating cult mind control i'm now in the book as one of the stories and uh I, I'm and, in the same book as one of the I, stories I, <laughs> what's that I'm in the same book as one of the stories because there you go. Yeah. But, so, but I, uh, I, I did get the chance to edit it a little bit. So, you know, yeah, yeah. It, so, it's actually so, none of it true what it says about me. And you know, I'm, I'm uh, near uh, as wonderful uh, as it says. But, but, the, uh, but yeah. the, the part to me that's most crucial to this story is what I would call the aftermath or the recovery process because. I think most people think, oh, so you got out of it, you figured out what it was, and that was it. And uh, and the truth, from my perspective, and I and I and I'm sure you probably could say something similar. You know, as 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 awful and terrible, or to just say just shitty as cult cult life is, um, making sense of that, taking ownership of that story, and then finding the way to reintegrate back into real life and society and, and mending all these relationships that I had severed, that was so much harder. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this idea that just getting out everything, everything we, you know, will be fine. It, it's very much like someone who's been in the military and gone into battle and, and really gotten traumatized. And, and, you know, you're sitting there potentially in the bar with your buddy afterwards. And he's clearly having a lot of trouble. You're like, dude, what's the problem? I mean, there's no guns going off, no bullets. You're just here having a beer, just relax. Everything's fine. Like it, no one can hurt you now. And no one really understands what, you know, how, how deep trauma wounds can be. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of the things I've learned that, you know, trauma doesn't go away, but if you work hard, you get really potentially good at managing it to the point that it can actually be very empowering. Yes. Uh, so, so that is the recovery process, and and it's also, you know, you not only have to figure out what happened so that you can forgive yourself, which is already a Herculean effort that takes to get there, but then besides that, you have to develop the communication skills to have the conversations with everyone who's cared about you while you went through this. Cause you know, a lot of times people don't talk about what I like to call the ripple effect. You don't, you don't go through the cult experience in a vacuum. It's not, un, it's not unlike uh, a drug addict where everyone who loves that person and cares about that person and watches them doing the self-destructive behavior, but feels powerless to stop them suffers a deep, deep wound. So, it's not you just suffering. Everyone who cares about you gets wounded in the process. So not only are they dealing with that, but there's also this question of how the hell did this happen? So, so you've got you know, basically all these people that care about you and who have been wounded, who are looking at you to provide the answers of what the fuck happened? And you've got to develop the communication skills so that be able to facilitate those conversations, which is the only way the healing can begin to start. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, and that's really hard to do. 
And, and it's also hard to recognize that those wounds they suffered, you do not have the power to heal those. They have to do that. And, and a lot of times they don't want to talk about those things. They don't want to, you know, it, it's, it's more of, I just want to know you're okay and we can leave it at that. But it's obvious to me that, well, you're not okay either. That you've gotten wounded too. And yet that's on that individual themselves to figure that out. And, and knowing that you're not the person that, that can do that is also hard because you feel on some level guilty that you caused this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a mess, but it's also well worth it. And, um, and as I say to uh, other people, I go, certainly um, I feel the cultic experience is a, is a universal one because mm -hmm. um, I've come to discover that in talking about my experience so many times. And after I got better at relaying my story, I started to watch something occur, which I never expected because initially I just wanted to kind of be um, clear and understood and feel um, seen and heard in a way that felt representative of what my experience was. Uh, and what I didn't expect was that the dynamics of, the, of, of a cult and and what I would describe as a cultic relationship were so much more commonplace because as I would start to break down on how I felt or how I, how I got involved and, and what I, the experience was like as I was going through it, instead of me just being a very entertaining dancing monkey in front of them, I'm like, oh, that's what it's like to be in a cult. Instead, I was watching people go like, oh my God, this sounds like the relationship I have with my father or my mother or my boss or my lover or... Like that's where I started to go, oh, wait a second. This is much more of a universal experience. Now, generally it's experienced one-on-one -on -one as, as they're experiencing and, and hearing what I'm telling. Mm -hmm. And from that point of view, I went through the extreme version of that one-on-one -on -one thing because there was a group dynamic. And, uh, and then also the stakes just seem to get higher in these cults because it's not just one person you're trying to, because the way I would define a cultic relationship would be um, you know, any person that you're seeking the love and approval from uh, in such a way that where you've kind of given your power away because that's become so in, important to you to feel that. And that person has taken advantage of that position to the point where they are now controlling and, and often abusing you because of that power dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, so the cult obviously is that dynamic, but there is also a group peer pressure element that heightens everything. And then uh, the stakes aren't just necessarily making the leader happy, so to speak, but in our case, the fate of the world light in balance. So it's like dialing the whole thing up on steroids. And uh, so it is the extreme version of that, but that's why I feel they're great teaching tools because sometimes we need to see the extreme version to recognize the more subtle aspect of that same dynamic in our own lives. And that's what I was experiencing quite often when I would have these conversations, albeit in social situations, because you know, I just had I just learned that um, that I wanted to not only be be um, transparent about what had happened and take ownership of my story, um, but I um I wanted to share it because I wanted to make the subject something that I thought could be potentially healing for others than just myself. And, and that's really been my thrust as I've gone through the, my uh, uh, recovery journey is to take the point of view of, I do believe it's, it's, a, it's a universal issue. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that if you don't talk about it, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. Now, if talking about it can bring about change, that's great, but you know, there's no guarantee, but I certainly will take that chance rather than talking, not talking about it and knowing nothing will change. Mm -hmm. So I'll just keep talking about it and try keep trying to, to draw comparisons and, and, and have these conversations and hope that um, the information, if people so choose to, to uh, you know, use it or absorb it, might serve them to make some, you know, connect, connect some dots and maybe make some healthier choices about their own lives. Yeah. I can't control that, but I certainly know the main way we do tend to heal is through getting information. So if I can 
in some way facilitate making some of that information a little bit more accessible than it has been in the past, then I'm doing a small part. So that's kind of where I come from with the yeah. with my whole thing. Well, that's good. And I think that's probably a good good place for us to say that's part one of what we're doing. I'm John Atex, my guest Hoyt Richards, and uh, we thank you very much for watching. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.